chapter 80. And, um, and you know, when people can't make it or we can, um, or we can go back and look at it. So now I understand um, after A, reading the story, some people had read this story for last time and um, said it was confusing. So I do want to spend a hot minute on the author and um, because I think the more you know about her, the more the story is going to make sense. So let's see what I got here. Um, all right. I'm gonna finish the story. Uh, oh, that is not it. Let's go. All right. Uh, that's not. I really wanted something else here. All right. Let me bring it up. So first of all, I always like to look at you know her picture and um. Wait. Now I'm gonna go back here and I don't know if anyone looked this up, but guess how old she is. Our age. Twenty-eight. Seventy-two, I think. Yeah, 72. Yeah. All right, this, yeah. I'm sorry, that does not look like 72. No, there was a headshot Maybe it's that was a... taken way before. I know. This uh, one's looking a little bit more like 72. There are some other ones, but, you know, but on her pages, um, anyway, so <clears throat> she is a philosopher. Oh, and shit. that's why... Uh, that, that I think just brings it all home. One book of hers that I read, and this is, um, I'm going to share her, um, her, uh, her, her website. So that's not 72. Sorry. Anyway, she grew up in White Plains. She graduated summa cum laude from Barnard. Um, and she has her PhD. She does a lot of um, teaching and full transparency. I, you know, I have the book. I had to look up a lot of words. I had to look up a lot of philosophers. Um, I, I think she has a thesaurus with her when she writes. And she <laughs> to find the most I, complicated I, word. Right. I think, um, so I, and then I realized that I had done, I had read a book of hers and it's this one, 36 Arguments for the Existence of God, a Work of Fiction. And I wow. did it in a study group because let me just th say, mm. I, it, for me, it was hard reading. And wow. I, I'm not talking about beautiful, dense reading like in Gentlemen of Moscow or even some of these other stories we've read, but this philosophical, and I had to take one phil philosophy course in college well, many years ago. It, it's hard for me. I don't know why it's if it's not concrete. Um, and this book, though, is interesting and got a lot of press and play in the press, you know, because of God. And I also think that she is a very, um, you know, she's well spoken and, you know, she's like your perfect foil for talking about philosophy and, oh, look, it's a woman, so on and so forth. Um, so I'll start out with you. Now that I've talked a little bit about Rebecca Goldstein Newberger, uh, did you like the story? No, no, no. no. All right, no. Alan, go ahead. <laughs> well, I like you. I was I was more prepared than usual. I think I read it for the first time Monday and Monday and I was so I, I, I was taken with the story. I liked it enough to, well, I mean, I would have finished it for class anyway. I liked it enough to really consider what was going on. I don't know if anybody else had the thought at the point where they're talking about the eyes of the, of the daughter, Allegra. And I thought, oh, it's got to be Jacob's daughter. And, but then, and she tells him that, oh, but your eyes are so beautiful, kind of to not to, to make what's his name, the Max, not, not feel yes. that way. And then, and then you get to the end. I mean, I thought Jacob was alive this whole time. Well, because you're in the beginning, he's come to, you know, dedicate a book to him. And I got the feeling, you know, that this was a, I, well, and then I went back to the, the title. I don't know. I was confused by the ending. I couldn't sleep last, no, the night before. So I reread the story. I was going to read it for a third time this morning, but I didn't have time. Um, I, is this all my, I guess my big question, is this all at his death, which is the way, what, what I, what I surmise that it's the end of his life. Cause there's some, unless a tear means something else, there's something at the very end about that. And he's the other two have been gone for a long time. His wife is gone. 
and, right. and there's a lot to discuss about the daughter. But I mean, I I can't. It was really confusing, but I I liked it enough to look up exactly what you just showed us about the author. And I you know looked at her picture and oh she's attractive and she certainly doesn't look like 72. And I I was curious <laughs> about her books. But and that book, the title that you just gave us sounded like it would be interesting. But you said that was also very difficult to read. I mean, you have to be interested in that and you have to be interested in philosophy. And um, I mean, and we only take things here um, chapter by chapter, but you couldn't just sit down and read that other book. I don't think in a weekend because you just couldn't. All right. We have a lot of people here. I have Alice, Susan, Judy, and then Terry. Alice. Well, yeah, I have a response to a lot of things. Um, <laughs> Ellen, I give you so much credit because I read the story. I really didn't get much out of it. And then I said, well, I know all these people say they read it again. And I wait, I even wrote down some words and then I had that I had no idea what they were. And I had no um, nothing that pushed me to want to read it again or to look up the words because <laughs> not that there were hints of things that were interesting, like about Poland and it seemed like it must have been right before the Holocaust or they were pushed out and then again what you said Ellen about whose daughter was Allegra were they, I thought oh, characters were dead I don't know I just it was it was too much it was too much for me for a short short story I don't know. I didn't care enough about anybody, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> wait, one, more one more thing. Vanessa, I took one philosophy course in college and I almost flunked the course. And I, I, I wait, but what's funny, what's funny is now I'm taking all these Northwestern classes from Sandy Goldberg. They're all philosophy. And I love them, but I don't have to read anything. I just listen to him and there's all these interests. So that's my story. Yeah, I, I, I can commiserate with that. All right, I have um, Susan, Judy, Terry, and then Lynn. Okay, so I started reading it the other day. I can't remember exactly which day. And I kept falling asleep. <laughs> I, was so I was so bored. I just couldn't get with it. And then I thought to myself, okay, I got to do this again. <laughs> so I started it again. You had and a cup I, of coffee. And, <laughs> and I mean, I, I think I've, I know I read it twice. <laughs> I'm still confused. <laughs> I didn't like it. I didn't care about anybody or any of it. And I thought, why on earth are we reading this? It just, I, I, I wish that I could have gotten something out of it, but I didn't. All right. Well, we still have, you know, 50 more minutes on that. Um, Terry. Oh, no, Judy, Judy. Um, I read it um, by mistake the first time. Me too. And, um, so I went through and I, I looked up every word. It got to a point where I turned to Roger and I said, what kind of a person writes stories where you have to look up every word when you're 76 years old? I mean, like, I don't get it. But uh, here's what happened when I read it again for, um, yesterday. You know how when you read Gail Sheehy's passages and when you read it at one point in your life, it means something and you read it at another point and it means something else? I began to realize the second time I read it that a number of her words mean two different things. I didn't know if it was tear or tear. Mm. And, and I think there are several experiences in the book where when you read them at one point and then you read it again later, it, it's something else. Um, it's not a fun read. I, I didn't like the story. I felt sorry for the man. And then I didn't feel sorry for the guy. <laughs> um, he, was a, he was a really bad guy, but he didn't realize he was a bad guy. Right. Mm -hmm. It's not uncommon. Um, so there were parts of the story I liked. And maybe it only came from reading it a second time, but um, <laughs> I didn't love it. Okay. 
Um, Terry, and then Lynn, and then Merle. Well, first of all, the fact that I read it last time, and that was not the time we were discussing it. Right. Was a, it was a blessing for me <laughs> because I let all this time go by. And then this today sneaked up on me because it was January and then, oh my God, it's February. So I thought, oh, we have the class. So I have to read it. So I read it again last night. And I don't know if I'm just reading too much into it, but I had a completely different read the second time. The second time I decided that the entire thing was a dream. Oh. And I didn't think that the first time I felt, I don't know at what point I, he told his daughter he had a dream, but this time I, I, when I started it over and I really read it and I didn't hate it, I thought it was interesting. I thought this is, this is a man describing his dream from the absolute beginning. And if you notice along the way, there are moments where this fist is, is grasping his heart and he can't breathe. And I feel like he's, I don't know if he's having a heart attack. He's definitely having, you know, heart issues that probably, you know, at the end, I felt the word was tear, the fatal tear as he stretches himself out to reach for it. I, I felt like that was it. Definitely was having a heart attack. And I, and when Allegra ran to, um, hail a cab this time I thought well what is she doing is she like trying to get them to the hospital rather than calling an ambulance or is she just fleeing I mean that was that was something you know to sort of think about but in addition to that I felt certain phrases were so beautifully written um when she says uh what like, page number page 211 in okay. the first paragraph like the lead cape they drape over you when they take your x-rays so the lassitude lay over him and then in the next paragraph his style was like a blind man's cane tapping out the contours of a landscape that none but the blind could know there had come a time in their relationship when the eloquent incoherence had made Max want to gnash his teeth in it. exasperation. I just feel that, yes, I looked up a lot of words too and they made no sense, but I feel like she definitely has a way of expressing, you know, using words in a beautiful way at various moments. And the other thing I just want to throw in is I feel like there's definitely a Holocaust piece thrown in for me when he talked about on page 210 Nina had surprised him with the lamp he had complained to her of how the university's lust for Lebensraum had cast his otherwise fine office into perpetual gloom so I looked up that word because I had no idea what that word was I looked that word up too and it's additional territory that a critical component of Nazi of the Nazi worldview that drove um, military conquests and racial uh, and racial policy. So there is that piece, and then there was an other piece that someone else referred to about Poland. So I think that there is all of this is like rushing through his head as he's in this dreamlike state. So that's my no. take. I mean, I think he has a heart attack and dies at the end, and you know that's whether he's seeing all those other. All right, I have Lynn, Meryl, Elaine, Lynn, and then Judy again. Well, I think that this story probably takes a couple of days to um, tear apart because there's so much going on here. My feeling, um, and I <laughs> talked to Ellen last night because she told me she was up in the middle of the night. And I said, I, you know what? I'm going to get up early tomorrow and reread this because I felt the same way everyone else did. And I said, I've got to give this a second read. Um, I don't think it, I, I don't think it was a dream. I think he is at the end of life. And I think that he is evaluating his life and he's asking for forgiveness because of the way in which he approached life. And he tells us, in the, and you know, I'm one for taking that first paragraph and, and looking at it. That first paragraph um, 
He claims that he is a man of ideas, not of material things. But in the whole story, he sort of contradicts that. So I think he does it, he is trying to figure out what his life was all about. And in the end, he realizes that he made his wife very unhappy and he didn't realize she was very unhappy. Um, and I believe essentially this is a story about the head versus the heart, that, that Jacob was a man of the heart. He said, you don't need musical talent um, to appreciate music because it's, it's part of your emotional being. And his, um, I mean, when, when, when Max says you're, you're spewing nonsense, this is not clear, you know, well, life isn't clear. And he uh, can't accept that. He needs boundaries. He needs ideas and facts. That's his life. Jacob is not like that. And um, what exists for one person does not exist for another person. It's your perception of life. And when he comes to the end of his life, I think he does realize this. I felt the same way Judy did. I first, my sympathies were with him and then not so much. <clears throat> so I think that he just was trying to, at the end of life, think where did he go wrong? And, and I also think that this was a question of, it's not only conflict with Jacob over philosophy, I think they were both vying for Nina. And Absolutely. Yes, yes, I yes, think yes, that's what yes, this yes. story was about. And yes. Nina, rep and they were always looking into her for her approval. And uh, if you watch her face during the story, I mean, she's trying to support her husband, but I think deeply she feels that Jacob is more in her, more in her, um, Wheelhouse or in her existence, whatever. Anyway, that's what I got on the second reading. The first right. reading, I felt like everyone else did, <laughs> I have to say. Well, thank you. Um, I I also got the feeling about Jacob and Max being in this competition. And then it made me feel that there was no way that Max could approve of anything that Jacob did because he was too jealous. And that whatever too. he did was just sour in his mouth. And, you know. But, and maybe he was, you know, nice to him because of Nina. All right. I have um, Merle, Elaine, and then Judy. I think at the beginning of the story, he's poking fun at philosophers and academics who use mm -hmm. language rhetoric that is inaccessible to ordinary people. And he even wrote a paper called The Eradication of Metaphysics Through the Rigorous Application of Logic to Language. So he's really talking about Ginger is not accessible, he says to me, could you speak more clearly? Mm -hmm. And he's really, really trying to say that a lot of academics are just inaccessible to the ordinary person, and that is not right. Then he starts talking about their friendship. With time, with time, their relationship had taken on more the nature of a rivalry than friendship. And I think at the end of his life, he is guilty that Binder stayed in Poland and may have died during the Holocaust, that Nina obviously loved him too, but chose Max for some reason. Perhaps she thought Max had a better vision of the future and they would go to the United States, but she still loved Binder and he never helped her find him. He just ignored that whole thing. And then his relationship with his daughter, he regrets that he had belittled Nina in front of his daughter. So Allegra always felt closer to her mother after that because she no longer respected her father. And I, I thought it was just a story of regret. But I thought the, mm -hmm. the beginning was rather clever because we felt it. It was inaccessible. We looked up every word and we still couldn't mm -hmm. understand what it was. And the last thing was I just started looking up things about philosophy. And in the end, it's all about what matters. What is being really about? What is knowing really about? So his story ends up being about what matters in his life and what he did wrong. That's right. yeah, yeah, fascinating, fascinating. Um, Elaine. Okay, um, I really did not understand the story at all. And has called Sue Roberts to a point. And I knew <laughs> Lynn would explain it at the uh, uh, 
Wednesday. But now I sort of understand it. And I think as we get older, we do go through what mistakes we've made, especially if you're not feeling well. Mm. And he probably was not feeling well and feeling isolated. Uh, if you read the newspaper, they talk about how elderly people are isolated and they should do this and that. And your children sort of, some of them forget you. I think after I listen to the group, I really understand it. And now I thank you all. And I didn't have to read it twice. <laughs> <laughs> and we're only halfway through, not even. Um, Judy again. Um, let me just say, I, I, I really um, agree with all the analysis. And I do agree. I'm sorry, I, I don't remember your name, but the woman who was talking about, um, there are beautiful passages in here. And there Terry. Are, yeah, okay. Um, there are, and I really liked it, but I'm upset with the author. She even says on 213, anything that can be said at all can be said clearly. And the truth is, there was much of this story that didn't have to be so obscure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. we, it, the points of the story and the interest in the story are still there, but it was unnecessary to make it so difficult to read. Even the point of saying, it, the concept, um, Merle, of saying that it was, um, to give an example of, of philosophers, and but not all philosophers are lost in their language. And I, I think this was a disservice. Uh, Sue, did you want to say anything? No? Okay. Um, all right. So um, I, I think since we read To Be a Man by Nicole Krause, and I thought that that was her therapy after she got divorced, um, I keep thinking about the author and, and, you know, where are they and where they're writing. And I do want to um, read this to you. Um, she was born Rebecca Newberger. She grew up in White Plains. She was born into an Orthodox Jewish family. Mm -hmm. She has one older brother who is an Orthodox rabbi and a younger sister, an older sister. Blah, blah, blah. She did her undergraduate work at City College of New York and Barnard. Barnard is really, you know, heavily Jewish and not just Jewish, Jewish, but, you know, Orthodox Jewish. She was the valedictorian in 1972, and she earned a Ph.D. in philosophy from Princeton, and she studied with Thomas Nagel. Um, and her dissertation was titled Reduction, Realism and the Mind. Um, and she returned to Barnard as a professor of philosophy. So uh, I think about, you know, here she grew up in this religious household. And um, I have to go back. And I don't think she, let's see early. You have to go like to their personal life. Um, uh, she married her first husband, Sheldon Goldstein. Okay, he was Jewish. Um, and they have one daughter. And um, this is what she said. Uh, I lived Orthodox for a long time. My husband was Orthodox because I didn't want to be hypocritical with our kids. I kept everything. I was torn like a character in a Russian novel. It lasted through college. I remember leaving a class on mysticism in tears because I had forsaken God. That was probably my last burst of religious passion. Then it went away and I was a happy little atheist. I just think that, you know, she's an atheist philosophy. She was orthodox. Ugh. Okay. Um, Lynn and then Susan. You know, it's interesting that you mentioned that because on page 212, it was just dropped in there, a sentence in there that I wrote in the margins, um, something about the religious, because religion hadn't come into the story at all. And then she says, uh, had they been such ardent friends that Binder should dedicate a manuscript to him? Yes, once upon a time, it was true warm feelings had flowed between them. Binder, suffused with sentiment, had made declarations of eternal friendship. But to declarations, most especially those alluding to eternity, Binder had been predisposed. It was his religious past that was to blame. Unlike Max's and Nina's enlightened 
families, Binders had been pious. And so, okay, he prided himself in having abandoned the old superstition, but it dragged behind him like a vestigial tail. The world to him was not an impersonal proposition. Ideas emerged from Binder like water, I love this line, that water that drips brown from rusting pipes. Of pure, clear logic, there was none. Instead, he propounded, propounded upon the total totality of existence, blah, 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 blah. Somehow, and it sort of dropped again, and I didn't come back to it. There is this superiority in his, uh, in his language here. And it seems to be that there was a religious conflict um, going on between these two as well. And I think maybe she's, from what you said, she is maybe der der through the character deriding orthodoxy here. And that absolutely other per, that um, Max comes across as a supercilious ass, honestly, sometimes. So yeah. I don't know. I, that was just my initial feeling when I read that sentence. Um, we're going to go Sue Wellick and then Ellen. Um, Sandy said, oh, I, I don't know. Someone said they didn't. Oh, Alice might have said, you know, you didn't like any of the characters. I liked Nina. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. and and so I thought if she saw good in Max, then we should see good in Max. OK, Sue, go ahead. So um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the author. OK, uh, everything that you have told us uh, that you've learned about this author makes me wonder if she truly has um, an understanding of humanity and human nature. And the people, who is she writing this book for? Yeah. I mean, it, to me, it was like, is, is, she is she bragging about her usage of all these words that nobody can understand? <laughs> is she saying, uh, look how smart I am and you're just dumb? <laughs> I mean, who was she writing for? Because... It just, as I said before, it just left me cold because I don't like reading a book where I have to look up every other word. And Especially when it's not on a Kindle or electronic. Like now, <laughs> well, mine when I'm reading, Kindle. I'm reading on my Kindle, you just press the word. Oh, and, right. And, it may, and you look up more words. I do. Well, mine is on a Kindle and oh. uh, on my iPad. And therefore, I don't even have the page number I yeah. have which is very frustrating. Uh, but it, um, as I said before, it just left me cold. And then I wonder about her motivation. Yeah, yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I have Ellen, Lynn, and Alice. Ellen. Okay. Um, I, I, Susan, you raised so many good questions that, that I totally agree with. I mean, you, but I think I had read that same line about her being an atheist that from the Orthodox background, she is now a happy atheist or however she put it. And I think that to some extent, maybe she's showing these different people as a treatise on religion. A at any rate, what I really, I, I don't know, it, it's, it's so confusing. And I think I'm of the, I love everything that's been, this is why this class is so great, because you get everybody's different view. Um, I think I'm at the point, I totally agree, as I said before, that I was the, it's an end of life thing. But I really still don't get the hailing of the cab. So can mm -hmm. we, what the heck is going on at the end of the story? And Allegra, you know, I, Nina is in an interesting, I think Allegra is interesting too, because we don't really, I don't know that I got any insight into where Allegra stands with all of this because she's the next generation. And, and so whatever's happened in the lives of Nina and Jacob and, and Max, you know, going down to her. And I don't know that we have a clear understanding of anything and I don't know why she's hailing the cab. So that's, I, I leave it with that question. I mean, I asked, I pose that question to the group. Okay. We have Lynn and Alice I, and then Judy, I will say this hailing a cab is quintessential New York. Um, <laughs> it is Lynn, Al Lynn, go ahead. All right, Ellen, where's the hailing of the cab? Where is right that? in the oh, end? Right. Who's hailing the cab? Yeah. Is Allegra. 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 The very last yeah. sentence. Okay. 
All right. He's having a heart attack. I'm looking at that. I'm very yeah, familiar yeah, with this now. <laughs> right. On the bottom of two. Yeah, you are. You know, the um, numbness in his arm and his jaw and the pain that in it, that has his heart in its unforgiving fist. And the end starts, forgive, forgive. This is a story about forgiveness and Judaism and the, the idea of forgiveness. And his life was so caught up that there's that statement I'm trying to find that um, Jacob loves with hope yes. and, um, and Max loves without hope. Was that it? Was that the, the it was, that was very telling. Uh, anyway, his whole life, as I said before, is an examination in the claws of death of what he did right and what he did wrong. My, you know, when we used, when I used to teach literature, I'd say to the kids, remember form and function, that form dictates function. Why is the author using this kind of form, this unclear, ambiguous words that you don't understand? What's the purpose of that? I think we need to talk about that. Why is it we had such difficulty understanding this story. It was like what I think is in the mind of Max. He couldn't understand Jacob, but Jacob understood Jacob. So we all have different perspectives of life. Um, I, my feeling is that um, clarity, we are seeking clarity. All of us. I couldn't wait to get to the last pages so I could understand this in, in my language. Um, but this language in the beginning was so obtuse. Um, and he and, and Max keeps pointing that out, how, how obtuse this is, how, how convoluted, and he doesn't understand it. But to, to Max said, I understand it. And it wasn't until Nina said, it's not the notes that we should focus on in music. It's the music. And that is the difference between the two men. Um, they, I had that down. That It starts in the bottom of 213. And, um, but Nina Orlovsky, I don't know why they put in her last name there, had turned her miraculous eyes, mosaics of green and blue on Binder. I think it's like music, Jacob. It was said more as a question than a pronouncement. Just hearing Binder's name in her mouth caused a sickening motion in Max, and Binder's eager look was repulsive. Music, too, is something more than notes, and the sublimity is not in the notes. She paused, seeking encouragement in the foam of her beer, and her pale lashes touched down on the poetic line that was etched along the edge of her cheeks. It's in the music. So... Yeah, that had come up before, that music right. in the notes. I wish right. I could find that. Okay, you well, look at that. I have um, Alice, Judy, Izzy, and then Elaine. Alice. Yeah. So this goes to what Susan said and Lynn. In the middle of 213, Max says, try to say it clearly, Bender. Anything that can be said at all can be said clearly. And then I guess Binder says, so you say, and Max says, and I say it clearly, as also clearly false. I, I yes. mean, I had a heart, but I think it's kind of ironic that Max is saying, say it clearly, because I feel like <laughs> not so clear. And maybe he's not so clear on his feelings to Nina and to mm -hmm. Alexa and yeah, I mean, but he's saying it, but just because you say it, I guess, doesn't mean that you live it. So, I mean, I, I think that in a way, that's kind of the essence of what I think what a lot of us are saying that it wasn't so clear, even though he thinks it, it should be clear, I guess. I don't know. All right, Izzy, what can you tell oh, us? Okay, so I read this. <laughs> Make it clear. A long time. I mean, the time that you put it in. So it was accidentally yeah, yeah. that I read it the yeah. first time. That was like yeah. a few weeks ago. Yes. So then I read it again last week. And I was 
totally confused and looked up some things, but understood it more. Then I was going to read it again last night. And I thought, oh, what the hell? You're going to all explain it to me today again. <laughs> so, that's why I'm here because you're all doing, I, I, I'm understanding much better. But okay. there was one, I mean, I thought this was just so, I don't know what the word is, esoteric or whatever. But there was one one thing on page 216 where she she laid unconscious and she spoke no words except help us. Help us, help us, help us. Who, 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 who help us? Was it me and her and Binder help us? Because they were, I, I thought the two of them had a thing and Max was very jealous. This is very superficial, but the whole story was enigmatic and just on a different, whole different plane than I could understand. But I'm, but I'm so glad that's why I'm here. I didn't read it, but I thought again last night, but I thought, okay, you're, you're all doing such a good job. I'm really learning a lot. Um, I don't I think just they that knew who, when she was laying there, here. And she kept calling all over and over again for help. Help us, help us. And then his daughter, Allegra, moved in right into the apartment to help take care of her. So I, I don't understand. I don't think they knew. And it also says, oh, I forgot to mark it down. You know, uh, Binder never made it to America. I can't, so I can't hear it. Oh, my gosh. Binder never made what it happened? to America, so that Wait. means what? She can't hear you. I'm not under. I'm not hearing anybody. Can you hear me? Turn I'm up your turn up your volume. Oh, I I should. I'm not hearing anybody. Oh, wait, let me just turn. I don't know. I'm sure, if she's on mute. I don't know yeah. what happened. Turn up your volume. I can't. I can't hear anybody. I know, Izzy. See if she can turn up her volume um, or um, yeah. she heard us before. Yeah, she should come back in. Yeah. All right, hopefully she can read. My volume is on. Um, I don't have her. Okay. Oh, see, now she muted herself, I think. All right. We have to move on here. I have to see who's next. Um, I think I was next. Yeah. Um. No, Elaine is next. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh no, Judy, Elaine, Merle. Um. I was gonna uh, try to answer um, Ellen's observation about hailing a cab. I think everyone abandoned him, and the cab is the abandonment of Allegra. Mm. I mean that's his perspective. Yeah. I don't. I don't. Know. I didn't get. Okay. That makes me feel bad for him. <laughs> you don't. You don't think she was taking him to the hospital? And that's what no. I thought. No. You don't think so? Nope. I don't. <laughs> wow. Um, you call nine one one, and she didn't. Yeah, but it's maybe New York. Maybe she panicked. They have nine one one in New York. I know, but it would be faster to hail a cab. I don't know. Wow. Look at how different we're all looking right, at this. Right. Um, okay. Uh, wait a minute. Judy. I already did. All right. Elaine. Okay. I think as many of these stories, they help us to think. We don't, you know, we in this book club want to understand everything. And I think life is full of, non-understanding and I think because we have so many different viewpoints on this and we are at basically some of us are at different phases of our lives because of our age and and I think that is the helpful thing I didn't necessarily understand it but I think now I understand it more and it gives me something to think about. And I think that's what the story is. And that's what philosophy is. You don't always have answers. And some of us think Allegra was calling a cab to take him to the hospital. Some of us think not. So it depends on where you're coming from and who you are. And, and I think that the beauty of the story, if we can find it, is that it gives us 
thought and going over in our minds. And that's what we do nowadays at our age, okay? So that's, and I'm beginning to like the story more than I did last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, when you discuss something, it just, you know, brings more to the table and more to your understanding. Okay, I have Merle and then Sue and um, Sue Roberts and then Lynn. Merle. Wait, I'll unmute you. Okay. Go ahead. I unmuted you. Um, he looks that next was thinking about how they looked, how Nina and, and his friend looked. Um, looking at Nina's eyes is the only meaningful measure of the soundness of their reasoning. Jacob Binder and Nina did not wear glasses. Their deduction of the world was from first principles. And mm -hmm. yet Max, who had done so much better for himself, we know Binder was a handsome man. Uh, we know that Nina was very pretty. She was slight and blonde. And he said in her very skin, the photons danced. They were very good looking. And yet the irony is about all this, he's, he's observing about this observation about his own life. And yet it was Max who had done so much better for himself. He got the girl, he published, he lived in the United States. He had a lovely daughter, Allegra. He did so much better and he thinks this is wrong. I think he is so guilty mm -hmm. that Binder ended up dying in, in Poland and that it was so awful and so unfair to Binder. And I, I think he also realizes that they spend so much time on these lofty things instead of realizing what really mattered in life. And the way that Nina dies it's so mundane, you know, just a pothole makes her fall. She's carrying grocery bags. And, and that is what is, that's what life is really about. These small mundane things that he was ignoring the whole time. I think it, it, you know, philosophy is about what matters in life. And he discovers at the end that what matters is your family or interpersonal relationships, these small things that he ignored his whole life. So, you know, the way he dies with the papers, he's dreaming about reading the essay. The papers are scattered all over. What a mess. Oh, and yeah. That's it, emblematic or symbolic of his life that he had really made a mess of it. Interesting. Interesting. Um, I have Sue Roberts, Lynn, and then Terry. Sue Roberts. Okay, so... I got that he was having a heart attack and he's going through all of these um, musings of, of almost like, um, like they just come into your mind here and there and someplace else, you know, um, not in any necessary uh, coherent way. It's not that and because he's ill and he's having a heart attack. <clears throat> and so, and things get messed up. But I think when you're talking about the philosophy, they, the two of them spent so much time discussing in their kind of language, which to us is mumbo jumbo. But there is a language of philosophy that yeah. they talk in. And it's very difficult to decipher when you don't know that language. It's like a mathematician. They spent so much time debating their philosophy mm -hmm. that he didn't have a grasp on how right. real life was passing him by. Yeah. And what and, and neither would give in to the other about how they talked in their jargon. So it was like one upsmanship constantly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, it's about what he, he realized he lost um, in looking at life rather than philosophical <laughs> ideas about being. He forgot to be in the being part. Right, right. Fascinating. Lynn. Excellent, Sue Roberts. <laughs> that was wonderful. I I right, you said an A. All say right, it's so erudite. I want to go back to the beginning again to the first paragraph. When he talks about that line, which I quoted at the beginning, where 
he says that he he focuses on ideas okay and other okay let me see it was in the first paragraph most people he says i'm going to paraphrase this focus on material possessions he on the other hand focuses on ideas do you remember that sentence mm -hmm. where is that this is his okay 210 the beginning even though he disproved of plato as an errant metaphys metaphysician who had much to answer for the history of western philosophy Max shared Plato's indifference toward material objects. The particulars of the perceptual realm to the senses did not speak to him the way ideas did. Okay, this is his guiding principle. And you have to keep that in mind because he lives a totally hypocritical life. Mm -hmm. The things that matter to him are he did much better, right? When he said, I did much better. It was all in the material realm. That's yeah. what uh, gave him importance and status. How many honorary degrees did he have on his wall? Um, you know, his, his position in the university. So I think that as he sees the end of his life, and I think Sue Roberts just said it beautifully, what, what did matter? And Alice said that. I believe what matters in your life is it the material things or is it yeah. that which uh gives your life meaning and the ideas and the emotions that go along with that and ellen i want to apologize to you it wasn't ellen it was terry i think about the dream idea because then i see it at the end on 217 he's talking to allegra in his um in the midst of his heart attack. Allegra, I've had such a dream. It was only a dream, Papa. I cannot see how to go on after seeing a dream. Don't be frightened, Papa. It was a dream about a friend of your mother's in mind, a friend long dead. I dreamed he had dedicated a manuscript to me. I'll tell you a story, Papa, and it will make the pain in your heart go away. So I think what Elaine said was very true. It's, it's ambiguous. The story is ambiguous. Life is ambiguous. And we all, had tr we all have trouble with ambiguity. So I would say whoever interpreted this story, you did a great job. <laughs> um, I was all, you said, Lynn, you said to go back to the beginning. And the first line is, and you always told us to look at that first line, Max Besserling awoke into a complicated yeah. thought. And I have that boxed in, awoke right. into. A complicated thought. A complicated thought. And it's up to us to, uh, you know, make right. sense of that complicated thought. And right. that's what he's doing. It, his life was complicated. And yeah, and I have I, I have Terry and then Beverly. Terry. Well, first of all, Lynn, I appreciate the apology. It's unnecessary. <laughs> I, I was going to go back to the passage you just read because it's very confusing to me. Because obviously, he is telling his daughter that he had this dream, specifically about a friend of your mother's and mine, long dead, who dedicated a manuscript to me. So it's like, what do we do with that? It, right. it, is the whole thing a dream or is it, is it not? I, I, I'm, I'm a little confused. And then I remembered this part, which really I thought was fascinating, because we talk about this being the end of his life, which it clearly is. He's clearly having a heart attack. On page 218, he talks about how when it's crushing all the air out of him, so he fights to take in breath, he doesn't want to breathe except for the necessity of forcing some air into the words so she will be able to hear, meaning Allegra, how it was that he had made a mistake, your stupid papa. Mm -hmm. He did not know the place for what it was, had never called it by its name. Though Jacob had gestured to me in the courtyard, turning away to show me the place so that I might find my way there. And I should have said the name aloud and blessed the place where I stood. But I looked away, forgive, forgive from that blessed place, my Allegra, my Nina. I turned my face, forgive, forgive. So is he, is he talking about in his dreamlike state 
Jacob is in heaven and he's he's showing him the way and he doesn't realize what's happening and there's a part of him that wants to go with him I mean that that sort of struck me right well the afterlife of skeptics no um so I have Beverly Izzy Alice Lynn and then Merle Beverly yeah I just say one more thing that I forgot to yes 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 when we talked about um Allegra running out to to hail a cab She's summoned by the voiceless call. So I think that line makes me feel like she's doing something for her father. She's not running away. Yeah, I agree. Right. Yeah. I hope. That's what I hope. All right, Beverly. I agree. Well, I was think- I'm listening to all of you. It was a very confusing story uh, to, to begin with. Um, and I read it a second time. And I don't think that we've talked about Nina and what her contribution was to his success. Yes. Because she took that red pencil and corrected (laughs) every single thing he wrote. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and I thought she didn't get her due or her recognition at all. And I wondered how much that was what turned Allegra away from her father because he really did treat Nina in a very a misogynistic way, very, very unacknowledged, bossed her around, fill my tea, do this, do that. And, and then he, it, in the story, it says she didn't like something she heard and that changed her allegiance completely. And the un- other thing I wanted to say about, about religion is Jews always named for the dead? And they made a decision early on that they were not going to do that. They were going to give her this musical name that is derived from a different country, which I think it's Italian, and uh, not named for the dead. So there was a lot of rejection of the past of their, their, where they came from and a lot of dismissing of Nina. Yeah, wow, you guys all have it. I have Izzy, Alice, Lynn, Merle, Judy, and Terry. So Izzy. I, I just wanted to, I don't know what happened after I talked. Right. <laughs> I must have not had much to say because it just went, <laughs> totally went on <laughs> mute. Took me so long to get back. I tried on my iPhone, but I'm here. I got back. Good, good, good. So I didn't hear what anybody said after I, Oh, well, we, I mean, we, um, I, I will have to say I have a hard stop today at 11. Um, but you know, we've been, we were talking, we talked about Nina, we talked about, you know, um, that Binder, um, you know, it was still in Poland and he's dead. Is this a dream? He's right. having a heart attack. Um, and, the and words um, about, about help me, help me when she woke up. Yeah. They, they don't know. We don't they know. said, they don't, it could have been, you know, uh, Binder, us, it could have been us. Nina, Allegra. Okay. Anyway. Or Max. Yeah, it's just, I, I really am so glad that I tuned in. Because good, 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 good. Okay. Um, Alice. Yeah. Well, this is going on. I was going to say this, but this is continuing what Beverly just said. On page 211 in the first paragraph. First of all, I'm thinking all the italicized words are his thoughts. Um, not. Oh. Um, what's being said and first it says there what Beverly said how Nina went through all of his manuscripts with the red pencil and then it says last but not least I wish to thank my wife who has read every draft of my manuscript and offered useful comments well that is (laughs) not really thanking her I mean she did much more than um, give useful comments so I mean I agree completely and I think maybe he's regretting that he never did give Nina, you know, again, at the end of his life, he's regretting that he never did give Nina her due, that she really, it was more than just being like, oh, yes, you know, Max, you're doing wonderful and, you know, keep going. No, she really um, helped him produce and, you know, he got all these awards and stuff. So she she was much more important. I think he realized at the end of his life that he hadn't given his wife her due. Yeah. 
I, if you want, I mean, we also have to look at the time period. I remind myself of that all the time. Um, lessons in chemistry, the chemistry lesson oh, is a fabulous that. book. And fabulous. I think it's very yeah, meaningful it. to everyone on this screen. Fabulous. I just finished it and I cannot <laughs> recommend it more, but it it's poignant. It. it makes you angry. And you know what Nina went through, you know, is not unlike what the, yes. the um, protagonist went through in there. Yes. Right. Yeah. Lynn. Um, okay, we don't have time to do this, but on the last page, um, he goes back to a scene from two uh, it was discussed on page 214. And I wish I understood this better um, when he said, where's the begin? The sentences are so long here. Wow, this is like a paragraph. This is when he's having his heart attack. And he said, though Jacob had gestured to me in the courtyard, the courtyard. So I went back to the courtyard scene because he said, turning away to show me the place so that I might find my way there. And I should have said the name aloud and blessed the place where I had stood. But I looked away, forgive, forgive. From that blessed place, my Allegra, my Nina, I turn my face, forgive, forgive. Okay, so I went back to 2.14 and I'm not gonna read all of this. Um, but in this courtyard scene, it is all, it, it, it talks about being in Krakow and the talk, I mean, there's a whole flashback of his past and when they were children and um, nature and everything. And I think it is just, again, his emphasis on the wrong things in his life. What, and again, coming back to, and I believe Alice said this, what really matters um, and the mistakes. And he said that, that he had made him on this land, I had made a mistake, your stupid Papa. So as smart as he was, he wasn't so smart in terms of things of the heart because when he looks at his wife and he sees the white salt that was coagulating on her eyelashes from all the tears that she shed. It somehow shook him up that he had never realized how much pain and suffering. And he said, and secrecy. And we don't know what that secrecy was all about. But Ellen wow. Gustin has a Ellen Gustin has a, an insight into that, don't you, Ellen? <laughs> oh, the in, I, I don't I don't remember what you, I I probably said that something about that. You think that 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 Allegra was Jacob's child? Oh yeah, I said that in the beginning. I, yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know. The I same don't know eyes. That, that oh, yeah, the same, yeah, but the yeah, eyes yeah. thing makes you think about it. And there's so yeah. many things that aren't really answered yeah. that are there for yeah. our ourselves yeah. To, yeah. to think about. Absolutely. All right. We have Meryl, Judy, and then Terry. Okay. And then um, Joyce. I, I saw an I read an interview with her that explains, I think explains the title. Okay. Scientists who write for popular audiences have brilliantly struck compromises where they can make it accessible. Why can't philosophers? Well, I think one reason is that philosophers are more insecure to speak accessibly because non-philosophers are skeptical. Uh, philosophers have any special expect expertise. After all, all people, not just philosophers, have attitudes and points of view on various philosophical questions, and they rather resent being told that there are professionals who can think about these things better. So I think the title- That's great. Very, I think that was very- yeah. About yeah, that. That absolutely. Yeah. Ab and I'm, we're going to, I'll have the last note on that, but um, Judy. Uh, uh, quickly, let me just say, I think he was an enormous chauvinist, misogynist. He even talks about male scholarship and, and yes. so forth. Yeah. But that, this, the line voiceless call, I think is from her mother. And I think she too was voiceless. And she decided not to take the father to the hospital. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, wow, you're giving us a lot to think about. Yeah, it's because I just finished the book about life and chemistry, but I feel oh. the women were offended. And there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Terry and then Joyce. Just, just quickly, I couldn't help but I had to look it up because I didn't remember the name of it. But if you all saw the movie or read the book, The Wife, the movie was Gwen. Oh, oh yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Husband who won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, oh. yes, yes. And that's what I. And that vision 
came to me as I was reading that part about Nina, because clearly that was the case here. And I think that he had a amount of guilt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, Joyce. I was infuriated that here, Jacob Reminder (laughs) dedicated his book to Max, who they had this love-hate relationship with, and yet Max could not bring himself or ever thought of dedicating one of his treatises to Nina. I never even thought about that. And I I think the the hate was on Max's side, not Jacob's, but why he didn't dedicate it to Nina, I never even thought about that. Good point. All right, I can. You you've illustrated this story. We meet in two weeks. I will tell you that I started this story, and I'm like, oh, there's something familiar here. And then when I looked her up, I was like, oh my god, she wrote that book. That was so hard to read. (laughs) And and Sue and some of you who had read it was like, this was hard, you know. So I I I was a little biased going in. But next week we are going to read Mandelbaum the Crip. Not next week, in two weeks at 10 a.m. Mandelbaum the Criminal by Gerald Shapiro. So um, I look oh forward God. to our meeting. Oh yes, Ellen. Yeah, uh, keep taping because I will be out of town. I will not be with you, and I probably won't miss the first two. But I'll if you yeah. send me okay. Out, I will. All right. Okay. okay. Vanessa. Um, Vanessa. Yes. Yes, Same Sandy. Thing. One thing I want to thank Merle for her note about the two films, which I did order. And the other thing is, I haven't changed my mind about this story. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Time. (laughs) All right. Well, we've got the next story, Sandy. It's good seeing everyone. If you have any questions, thank everybody because it really was a good luck with your mom. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye.